the May 12th um, school board meeting. If you could please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, okay. Alan, do you have any adjustments to the agenda? I do have uh, two adjustments. If you will look under communications, I am taking E, which is high school laptops, and F, which is flex, off the agenda for this evening. Okay. Um, okay, approval of the school board minutes. Can I have a motion to do that? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Rebecca? Um, comments, questions? All those in favor? Thank you. Um, comments by our student representatives? Do we have any here? If you could just step up to the podium and let us know your name. Welcome. Hi, my name is Brian Chosey, and I'm the eighth grade student council rep. Um, this is my middle school report. Um, the sixth grade is finishing NWEAs tomorrow, and they are the last to finish the NWEAs. And previously, last week, they went to Chewankee, and Mr. Doan, the sixth grade teacher, said that they did a good job at Chewankee. And tonight, on Tuesday, the chorus is performing their last performance, and the high school has a concert as well. The, on Thursday, the middle school band is performing at 7.30. And the last dance on May 29th is at 7 p.m. And at 6 p.m., before the dance, there is a cookout, and also on May 29th, there is an in-school concert with the band and the chorus. Any questions? Does anybody have any questions for Brian? No. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Did you get any, uh, what about students coming back from Chewanke? Any feedback from, from some students? Uh, yes. Um, there were, there's Cole from sixth grade said it's fun, exciting, and Ben also agreed with him, fun, satisfying. A student, Rachel, said she loved Chewankee, exciting, challenging, and she'd love to go back. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. I'd just like to add a quick um, thank you to the staff at the middle school who um, attend Chewankee on an annual basis because inevitably, I think two out of my three children have had horribly rainy weeks. So it seems like it always rains there, and I know that that's tough duty for um, staff members, so thank you. Um, okay, comments from the public on non-agenda items. Okay, I'm, David, I'm, if you could introduce yourself, and we will are going to limit your time, if you would. Sure. My name is David Hellman. I live at 22 Cranbrook Drive. Uh, the issue I want to raise for the board to consider is uh, we're currently having an election, uh, a referendum on the school budget. And this year there's been a great deal of dispute about what, what are facts and what are not facts. Um, and what I want to submit for you to consider is uh, the series of, of uh, the original flyer, the postcard, an email, given out by Kate Brawl, the investigative report that found it to be inaccurate, the uh, Cape's group's uh, uh, press release that was inaccurate, plus your, I want to have your own website because I thought it was excellent with me, uh, reporting the facts. And to me, uh, th there's a, uh, an overwhelming amount of misinformation out there. When I was calling people to try and talk to them about it, they were citing facts that just were completely confusing, completely uh, inaccurate. And, and it's just, it's, the democratic process relies on actual facts being given out, true facts being given out, and that people do not distort and misrepresent the facts. And whether, that, that, whether or not that has occurred here, I would leave it to your judgment, but I'd ask that you consider it. And I think it is your role to ensure a fair democratic process, because without it, if we can't have a fair democratic process, we can't have a fair referendum or election, uh, this isn't a democracy. 
and I think it's been taken to an extreme this time, and, is, and I'd like to submit this to you for your consideration for what you think is appropriate action, whether it be looking at the existing laws or whether it's for proposing something for the future so that we can try to have a reasoned, fair debate. Don't mind a debate. I don't mind everybody in the world disagreeing with me. I think that's perfectly appropriate. But I do not think it's appropriate to misstate facts. And that's what I, that's what I would ask the board to consider. And I'd like to submit this information for you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, David. Are these copies that we, that the board can keep, or do you want it? No, you can keep those. I kept one for myself. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I, I did want to have your website, because I thought that was a really good to juxtapose against what it was said, but I assume you can get that yourself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else from the public who would like to speak on non-agenda items? Okay, thank you, David. Um, we're mo moving on to recognition. Ponco principal for the day. Do you want us to push that down a little bit? That? Is that gentleman not here yet? Uh, he asked when the meeting started. So He'll be back. Should be coming right along. Sure, we will, because I think the science team, the high school science team, is here. Are you going to the I'm just going to welcome the high school science team, and particularly uh, what you have done over the last few years uh, from Maine going to Massachusetts and doing a stellar performance particularly this year. So we're really anxious to hear what you have to tell us. Good evening. Thank you. I'm Caitlin Pomeroy. I'm one of the captains of the science team. And I'm Evan Nagel, and I'm also a captain of the science team. So we just wanted to tell you a little bit about what we do on the science team. Um, we have three main activities that we participate in. They're the Science Olympiad, the North Shore Science League, and the Science Bowl. Um, the Science Olympiad is a full day event. Um, it occurs once a year in the spring. Um, students study for about a month in advance. Um, and there are various categories that you can participate in. I've participated in um, events in biology, in chemistry. Um, I did a herpetology event last year, which is a study of amphibians and reptiles. Um, we did very well on that. Um, I've done um, a CSI category. They give you a bunch of uh, different like evidence and you have to say who committed the crime and you do different like lab tests and stuff to figure it out. And I also um, did um, the Sound of Music event last year with um, Dylan Sherry, a brilliant musician who graduated last year. Um, and we had to like create instruments and play scales and stuff and look at the different like scientific methods of doing that. Um, and we won an award in that event. So that's the Science Olympiad. It happens once a year, and it's a really fun event. And it gives us the opportunity to compete against um, high schools in Maine, um, which is different from the North Shore Science League. Right, so the North Shore Science League takes place in Massachusetts. And they hate us there because we drive down from Maine and we beat them. <laughs> um, it's really fun. There are like five different meets each year, like once a month. Um, and we put together a team of individuals from the team. Not everybody goes every time. And um, we find out about a month in advance what the different categories will be. And we spend that time prepping. We brought um, a member of our science team to demonstrate. He's, he's our star builder. Um, so we brought him, and he's going to demonstrate something that he built for that. But there are a bunch of different like categories that they choose from. Um, it's pretty similar to the Olympiad in the sense that there are a bunch of different categories, but there are three each month instead of all at once. Um, and in years past, we would take vans down, so there would be a pretty limited number of people that could go. But this year we took a bus, which allowed us to take two teams, um, and it's just a great time. Which we, meant a lot more people could be involved, which yeah. is really great. Um, and then the last thing we do is the Science Bowl. And unfortunately, we couldn't participate in that this year because we had con conflicting dates with other activities that we were doing. But um, I was part of the Science Bowl team last year, my junior year. And um, it's kind of like a game show setup. You have a buzzer, and you're against a different team, and it's all timed, and it's very intense. But um, um, you, we went, um, and we participated at USM, and we 
um, competed against teams from Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts, and we won our regional science bowl, which was really exciting because that meant we got to go to the national science bowl in Washington, D.C. last May, um, which was an incredible experience. There are like 60 teams from across the nation and Puerto Rico and all of our territories, and um, we compete in this like five day long, extremely intense game show um, type competition um, with some really, really tough questions. And um, last year we, they have like a sub competition that's more hands on. Um, and we won um, a small grant for our school in the radioactivity um, and radioactive decay um, category. So that was really exciting. So I guess, do you have anything else? That's all. So I guess we'll have Sammy show you his creation. Can help you set it up. Okay. My name is Sam Nassif, and I was the builder of the National Science um, North Shore Science League events. This is a windmill that I built for one event. It was um, the challenge was to build a turbine or a windmill type thing that could spin the fastest, and then take that spinning energy and generate it into volts. And how it worked was there was a fan similar to this one and you were allowed to move your windmill closer or farther away or all around it to try and get the highest peak of voltage. And should we demonstrate that? We're going to go like this to move it around to try and get it spinning the fastest. And there's a voltmeter attached to these wires. Oh. It would tell us how many volts it was generating. This generated about 3.8 volts, I believe, which was pretty high. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And how I went about this event was um, they gave us this little black hub and these dowels to affix the fins to. And I went to the hardware store with my dad, and we found this aluminum flashing to build the fins out of. We chose it because it was very lightweight, and there was a lot of it, so we could prototype fast. And I just drew out a whole bunch of fin designs, cut them all out with like six fins and three fins and five, and just prototyped it until I found the one that worked the best and got the most volts. I tested it at my house with a voltmeter that Dr. Grant lent me. And it came out with these fins in the three fin design, similar to the windmills you see on wind power plants, which I expected. And we just went to the event, and this is what we did. Thank you. <laughs> I came in first place by about 0.8 volts. Wow. Right. Wow. That's a huge. Incredible. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, something that Sammy is neglecting to mention is that there were 30 other teams there. Uh -huh. How many? 30. 30. 30 other teams. Yeah. So uh, tonight uh, we are not coming before the board to make any funding requests. Rather, we're here to <laughs> <laughs> let you know what we've done over the past four years. And uh, there's several things I'm very proud of. One of the things that I'm probably most proud of on the science team is the participation. We started for five years ago, we started off with nine students. This year, I went through today and counted how many students have done things, and we had over 40 students compete in science team events this year, which is just an amazing rate of growth. Okay, so we're going to start off with the Science Olympiad. Uh, in 2005, we came in seventh place, starting. Uh, in 2006, we came in fourth place. Uh, in 2007, we came in fourth place again. In 2008, we came in second place. And then this year we came out in third place. So we have two trophies from that right now that Evan and Caitlin are holding. Uh, so I took a look at this data. And being a scientist, I wanted to analyze it. So I, of course, plotted the year on the x-axis, <laughs> plotted the placement on the y-axis. <laughs> Using graphical analysis, I came up with a trend line. And from this trend line, I made a math model. All the physics students are cringing right now as I describe <laughs> this process. Now, it comes up with a negative slope, and from this math model, you can make predictions. And according to the math model I came up with, it predicts that in 2010, 
we will take first place. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Um, on to the North Shore Science League. I want to talk a little bit about this league before we get to that. There are 30 teams in this league, some of the best public and private schools in Massachusetts. So we are competing against schools that are fairly similar to Cape Elizabeth. We're competing against Masconomet. We are competing against Andover. We are competing against private schools like Pingree, St. John's Prep, St. Mary's Prep. I mean, these are some good schools. Um, again, the, t the league has fluctuated anywhere from 27 to 31 teams over the past four years. And here's how CAPE has done. In our first year, we captured a third place. Uh, in our second year, 2007, we came in first place, and they gave us a really big, gaudy trophy. <laughs> uh, last year, we came in third place, and then this year, we once again captured first place. <laughs> and on to the Science Bowl. Um, in 2007, they came in second place for the regional competition. We got a nice plaque for that. At the national competition in Washington, uh, they made one heck of a hydrogen-powered electric car, and for that one, we got the trophy with the little car on it. <laughs> <laughs> and then in 2008, they came in first place in the regional. And for that first place in the regional, we got a very nice banner. That anyone who's been <laughs> in the high school has seen this banner up for quite a while. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh I've yeah. I've seen that. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would like to take credit for some of these accomplishments, but the truth be told, it really comes down to the captains and the members of the science team. They have done, I can't begin to tell you the tremendous effort that has gone into this and the work they've done. The captains organize incredibly well. They, they're motivated, they're intelligent, and they really have done a phenomenal job. Um, on behalf of the science team, I'd like to thank a couple people. Uh, first of all, I'd really like to thank the Cape Elizabeth administration, in particular Mr. Shedd and Mr. Hawkins for supporting us through these four years, five years. Um, I'd like to thank the school board. Five years ago, you guys gave us permission to go to Massachusetts, and you have given us the funding to make this possible. And finally, now probably most importantly, I'd like to thank the community of Cape Elizabeth for supporting us through these years and hopefully we continue to make you proud and continue to do what we've done in the past. Uh, we genuinely appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. Any, anybody? Does anybody want to comment or any comments? I would like to, but if the board member would like to comment first. I would really like to thank you for how you represent Cape Elizabeth, because it is an extremely important gift you give to this town. And I also would say, as I sit here and talk with you and your teacher, there are other students in Cape Elizabeth who also do things that make me very proud to be the superintendent in Cape Elizabeth, because you are dedicated, caring individuals. And what you have done I can remember so clearly when we first talked about this and wondering, can, can they do anything? And look where you are now. You represent what many young people in Cape Elizabeth do for themselves, for their community, and I can't thank you enough for all you do. Thank you so much. I'd just like to echo those words. I still vividly see you five years ago coming to the board and asking and thinking, going to Massachusetts. So I want to... I think you undersold yourself, Dr. Gret. First, I'd like to congratulate the students. You guys have done amazing things in five years, and I think you undersold yourself because it had not been for your vision and initiative, the team wouldn't have got started. Um, and you are up against tough competition, one of them being my alma mater, which I will rip, na leave nameless, but you guys have done <laughs> some great stuff, so congratulations. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. On to next. Boys item. State and Girls State? Is that what is that Jeff? Oh, no, is, is Tom's person is in A, right? So oh. it's Jeff. Jeff, are you going to, um, I think you're up next. <laughs> Will that be the Thank principal? You. Yeah, um, Girls and Boys State is a, um, it's a prestigious event, <clears throat> activity that takes place over several days. Um, 
each year during the summertime. Um, and high schools across the state nominate um, boys and girls, um, depending on what the supporting organization, the organization that's putting up the funds to make it possible to send delegates, asks us to do. Um, and so the guidance counselors get together primarily with the social studies teachers and seek out students who have expressed who have an interest in public policy, uh, who are good speakers, who are interested in social studies. And so this year I'm delighted to let you know that the girls' state delegates, um, sponsored by the Cape Elizabeth Lions Club, and thank you to them. Um, we have one girls' state delegate, that's Macaulay Cliff, um, and another one sponsored by the G.G. Monks Foundation, that's Devin Bottomley. The boys' state delegates, um, again sponsored by the Cape Elizabeth Alliance Club, is Peter Brigham. And sponsored by the G.G. Monks Foundation is Niles Bond. And then there is an alternate delegate, Chris Integlia. Um, all really good students, good citizens at Cape Elizabeth High School and very deserving. And the reports I always get back from girls in boys' state is that it's a, it's a really good, interesting event where they, they get together with students from across the state. They are essentially a mock legislature in a sense. They elect governors, they elect senators, they elect a whole bunch of different folks, and it would be great to see some of these folks, I'm sure, will be elected to those positions. So congratulations to them and to their parents. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Pond Cove and Middle School Arts Night. Um, good evening. I'm speaking on behalf of Mary Jane Johnston from Pond Cove, the new art teacher, and myself. We joined forces this year to combine both schools and have an annual art evening. And we had probably the largest turnout we've had. This was the third annual evening. And by joining two, the two schools and having parents have the opportunity to see what goes on through K-8, I thought it brought a really, it brought out more positive time for parents to reflect what goes on in school. We also had what took place in the middle school, I can speak for what we did, is Suzanne McGinn and Lisa Gent spearheaded the committee and they took over every facet of the art show. My students made the art, I matted the art with some parent volunteers and they took care of everything else. Trish Brigham helped hang the art show, as many other parents, and it really wouldn't have been possible without this partnership. That evening, um, I think we had over 300 people. We had refreshments, we had Terry White in the jazz band, we had Becky Bean with drumming, we had a student bazaar where students were able to sell their works to the public and donate um, part of it towards the framing of the permanent art collection. We also had parents who have come into the art room for a new program this year, which is called Visiting Artists from the Community. Parents come in, they volunteer their time, and they speak about their art making process, their vocation as an artist in, in many different forms, and they work with our students at the middle school. So it was a great success. Clara Cohan was there. We finished up our third year with the PAL partnership, which um, was the sculpture garden. None of, a lot of the endeavors that we've taken on in the middle school would not be possible without the support of SEAF and the Middle School Parent Association, so we wanted to thank you on that. Next year, the art show, we expect you to be there. And you can help hang also, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marguerite. Does anyone have any comments? or Could I just add, Marguerite, that I'm going to use that term again, vision and initiative. Three or four years ago when you came, it was your vision and initiative with Steve's support that got the art show going. It's an incredible amount of work that you've put in, and I think this year was the biggest and best ever. So like Dr. Barrett's math chart, you're only moving up, so thank you. Uh, Maine High School Proficiency Standards results. Jeff, do you want to speak to that also, uh, showing, or do you, I can speak to it either way? Sure. Okay, all right, very good. Uh, what you have in your packet is a set of charts uh, that came from the Department of Education, which shows the performance in 2007-2008 of Maine on the Maine High School assessment. It had been administered in the spring of 08. Uh, what is important about that chart is if you look at it carefully, you will see the, uh, it is done by top to bottom, 
And it shows you that the very top of the state is the Maine School of Science and Math, which is a program sponsored by the Department of Education, but it is an, a program that is controlled and can pick and choose the students who attend there. The second one is John Baptist Memorial High School in Bangor, which is a parochial high school. And then the first public high school in the state on this is Cape Elizabeth High School. And I think it's extremely important for us to realize that as a public school, uh, we are number one in the state. We're followed by Yarmouth, and then Falmouth, Greeley, and York. But Cape Elizabeth High School scored at the very top as a, as a public high school. And so again, I congratulate the students of Cape Elizabeth High School, the teachers of Cape Elizabeth High School, and the teachers who came before them who helped provide our young people with the knowledge in order to perform at this level. And so I think it's a really important, again, a piece to look at as far as how well our students can do. Thank you, Alan. I think our principal for the day of um, Juan Po yes. is here. So, Tom, can we um, switch over, go back to you? Actually, I think he's a man who needs no introduction. This is uh, Will Corsello, who was principal for a day. I'm just here on my uh, day off to support him. Um, He's going to, I think, review his day and then field questions from you. But I should say at the outset that uh, Will was a delight to be with. He was independent, resourceful. He fielded a lot of emails, did some paperwork, and settled some classroom crises, which he'll tell you about. Um, well, the day went good, and um, I didn't really see much like running in the halls or anything. And. Um, was Mr. Eismeyer running in the halls? <laughs> no. Not <laughs> yet. And um, uh, we uh, went around classrooms and um, we solved uh, one problem where kids in one uh, class they got up. Uh, and got in line, they were quiet, and then when they got out of the class classroom, they were all noisy. So, and we solved that for having like, you get a star every time that you do a good job in line. And then five stars is a 10 minute extra recess. You worked on security for the grown ups. Yeah, uh, I check for their uh, ID badges, and if they don't have one, I give them a sticker. And sort of wrote them up, too. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any questions or comments? For yeah. Will? Did you get to make any new rules for the day? Um, gum, hats, pajamas, five minutes extra recess. And mm. yeah. no homework. No homework, yeah. Right. So today was your day, apparently, because I was over yeah. there and they were all in yeah. pajamas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I felt a little out of place, but that's all right. <laughs> Anybody else? Which Thanks. teachers do not have their ID back then? <laughs> <laughs> um, you don't have to answer. It, it was a 50 50. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Weismar, are you going to be making some new rules tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> you may all be hot tonight. Can you reveal some of the excuses for not having the badges? Uh, like, uh, like I sat on mine and it broke, and, <laughs> and oh, I left it in my desk. Uh, I left it in my car. A lot of different excuses. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have questions for our principal of the day? One more question. Do you think you'd like to do this for a living? No. <laughs> it's a hard job, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's a hard job. <laughs> Want to come? Thank you very much. It's always nice every year to see someone come in who's taken on the job of principal for a day, give Mr. Eismeyer a day to rest and to make sure the building runs well. And it's been interesting that the four years I've been here, I really haven't heard anyone run into big problems. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's great. Thank you very much.
Thank, Thank you, you, Will, for coming. We appreciate it. Um, Teacher Appreciation Week, do you want to start or shall I, Ellen? I, what, I, what I would like to say is this, is that this last week, I think, was officially Teacher Appreciation Week. It's, it's a funny week to have because I think when you look at teachers, you need to appreciate what they do every single day. Uh, teaching is not an easy job. Teaching is demanding. Teaching takes a lot of time and effort, a lot of thought in order to be sure that things are going appropriately. I did send a letter out to staff today. I don't know if they've already received it yet or not. Just to let them know that, again, as I, as I speak as superintendent, as someone who was a teacher, has been a principal, now a superintendent, how much I appreciate the work that teachers do in the classroom and outside the classroom, and also how much the people do in the system who support the teachers in the work they do whether it be administrators, educational technicians, food service, uh, bus drivers, custodians, maintenance people, everyone plays a role. But it's the teacher who provides the direct instruction that makes or breaks what the future means for each young person. So I truly appreciate what they do. I hope you all know I appreciate it every day, not just one week out of the year. But uh, I thank you all. Um, when I knew this was coming, I. I Wanted to, I wanted to be eloquent, um, and since I am not that great at that all the time, I found a great story to read about um, in appreciation of our teachers. So if you will indulge me, um, it's called The Creation of the Teacher, and it's, the author is unknown. The good Lord was creating teachers. It was his sixth day of overtime, and he knew that this was a tremendous responsibility, for teachers would touch the lives of so many impressionable young children. An angel appeared to him and said, You are taking a long time to figure this out. Yes, said the Lord, but have you read the specs on this order? The teacher must stand above all students, yet be on their level. Must be able to do 180 things not connected with the subject being taught. Must run on coffee and leftovers. Must communicate vital knowledge to all students daily and be right most of the time. Must have more time for others than for herself or himself must have a smile that can endure through budget debates, problematic children, and worried parents, must go on teaching when parents question every move and others are not supportive, must have six pairs of hands. Six pairs of hands, said the angel, that's impossible. Well, said the Lord, it's not the hands that are the problem. It is the three pairs of eyes that are presenting the most difficulty. The angel looked incredulous. Three pairs of eyes on a standard model? The Lord nodded his head. One pair, this gets, I might get a little teary reading this because I think it speaks so much to our teachers. One pair can see a student for what he is and not what others have labeled him as. Another pair of eyes in the, is in the back of the teacher's head to see what should not be seen, but what must be known. The eyes in the front are only to look at the child or as he or she acts out in order to reflect. I understand and I still believe you without so much as saying a word to the child. Lord, said the angel, this is a very large project, and I think you should work on it tomorrow. I can't, said the Lord, for I have, some very, I have come very close to creating something much like myself. I have one that comes to work when he or she is sick, teaches a class of children that do not want to learn, has a special place in his or her heart for children who are not his or her own, understands the struggles of those who have difficulty, and never takes the students for granted. The angel looked closely at the model the Lord was creating. It is too soft-hearted, said the angel. Yes, said the Lord, but also tough. You cannot imagine what this teacher can endure or do if necessary. Can this teacher think, asked the angel. Not only think, said the Lord, but reason and compromise. The angel came closer to have a better look at the model and ran his finger over the teacher's cheek. Well, Lord, said the angel, your job looks fine, but there is a leak. I told you that you were putting too much time into this model, you cannot imagine the stress that will be placed upon the teacher. The Lord moved in closer and lifted the drop of moisture from the teacher's cheek. It shone and glistened in the light. It is not a leak, he said. It is a tear. A tear? What is that? asked the angel. What is a tear for? The Lord replied with great thought. It is for the joy and pride of seeing a child accomplish even the smallest task. It is for the loneliness I'm sorry, this just, <laughs> it's not even about my kids. Well, it is. It's about all of our kids. It's about you. 
It is for the loneliness of children who have a hard time to fit in, and it is for compassion for the feelings of their parents. <laughs> it comes from the pain of not being able to reach some children and the disappointment that those children feel in themselves. It comes often when a teacher has been with a class for a year and must say goodbye to those students and get ready to welcome a new class. My, said the angel, the tear thing is a great idea. You are a genius. The Lord looked somber. I didn't put it there. So if I can control my emotions, it's just that was a, a great, um, I think, s s expression of all the wonderful things that our teachers do and a true um, thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to comment or ask <laughs> anything I can't? Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, moving on. Communications, middle school 5-6 looping. Adam? Back earlier in the school year, I was approached by Adam, and, uh, Adam Killip and his teaching partner, Elizabeth Johnston. And they just kind of sat in the office with a little bit of a quizzical look, and I thought, oh, God, they're going to hit me up for some budget money or something. And uh, the, the question was about, so what's, what's your take on looping? And I assume they weren't talking about some crochet piece. So. Um, I explained to them that uh, I had experienced looping myself in my first two years of teaching in another district and thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, seen lots of good research on it. You have to have the right setting for it to occur, you have to have uh, a good plan about so what occurs over a two year span when you're working with kids. The easy research part to it was that there's in, in, uh, in a two year time span, most of what I'm reading says that you, you're going to get about two and a quarter years of educational, of academics out of that year span because just from the sheer fact of the lack of wind down and the lack of startup. So that given the familiarity and so forth that, that goes along with uh, uh, the kids knowing the teacher and the families and the students knowing their, uh, the expectations makes it a, a really good piece. And so I asked myself, where is this going? So he said, well, we, we'd like to consider that. I said, that's great. I said, that's half the puzzle. The other half is who are you looping with? So um, they went up to talk to some of the folks in the, all the folks in the sixth grade and said, this is kind of what we're thinking. And, and we'd really, we'd, we really want to give this a shot. And, and what do you think? There wasn't a lot of question from sixth grade teachers about, um, so what are the merits of this? I think we're all pretty clear about that. And uh, the questions were more about, so exactly how would this work and what would you be looking for for swapping? So a lot of conversations with sixth grade teachers and a um, good length of time mulling it over. And then probably a couple of weeks ago, I was talking, uh, Joe, Doan, Joe Doan came down to see me and said, I'd really like to give this a shot. And uh, Claire Ramsbotham is his teaching partner. And Claire also said, you know what, I, I think this has some really good prospects to it, so let's give it a shot. So they've agreed to, to loop to the fifth grade for next year and over the 2009 to 10 year, bring the fifth grade up to the sixth grade, and they'll move up this coming year with their current classes. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about what that might look like? Yeah, um, <clears throat> my voice has been in and out, so Excuse me? I apologize. <laughs> but, um, it's one of, the, one of the costs of teaching that doesn't appear in a line item. Um, wasn't on your spec there, <laughs> wasn't it? No, it was not. Um, yes, so basically, and another thing to mention is that Elizabeth and I have both taught sixth grade, too, so it's kind of a natural thing for us to do. I was also part of a, um, I was a long-term sub for about half a year on an eighth grade team that was on the, the tail end of a seven, eight looping experience, and it was, uh, they were the, the most, they were the oldest group of eighth graders I've ever worked with. Um, it was the most amazing experience in terms of uh, how they interacted with the teachers and how well the teachers knew them. And I think beyond the academic advantage, um, I think what you gain in terms of knowing the kids and, I mean, it's easily into the middle of October before you really 
can start to talk about a student as if they were your own. Um, and so you, you, don't, you don't have to start over at the beginning of the year with the student. They don't have to start over with you, which is, which is a good thing. Um, so the way I see this working out is there's really three, three parties involved. And from the teacher's perspective, um, I mean, the advantages to us are you know, purely selfish. Our job becomes a lot more uh, easy at the beginning of the year. We don't have to, um, we don't have to I don't want to say waste time because uh, I don't think it's a waste of time, but we don't have to do again a lot of the same diagnostics that we would have, uh, have to have done. Um, we don't have to kind of play the uh, give and take of, you know, is this really how hard they can work? Can they work a little harder? How do they respond when I push them? How can I push them? All those things. Uh, from the student's perspective, uh, I think when we first brought it up with the kids, they were a little, um, for the most part, they were very excited. Uh, the kids who were kind of hesitant, I think, were the ones that were looking forward to, you know, having a new teacher every year and new experience. And um, so we really had to kind of sell them on, you know, it's, it's only one year um, and, and kind of sell them on the benefits. Um, I think also they're going to find that their learning will be a lot more um, efficient, I think, and they'll be able to build on a lot of the growth that they've made this year. Um, and from the parents' perspective, I'm hoping that the comfort of, of knowing us um, and knowing the gains and the things, specific strategies that we worked on with the kids academically and uh, socially and organizationally and all those things um, will just it will all kind of roll into um, you know just a really good experience for those kids heading into next year. Um, so it's it's. it's Really exciting. We'll we'll keep tabs on the data about how the students are doing in this situation for next year, and then over the two-year piece with the Dome Ramsbottom team, and uh, we'll present that information to to the school board as well as to uh, to the teaching staff, for instance, so that they can consider that. Because personally, I I'd really like to see that take root and to have a cycle of people. Um, feeling empowered to do that. One, one of the huge benefits to this, beyond just the student uh, um, uh, testing and, and data and information, is that the teachers will know intimately what the curriculum is that is being developed uh, over the, this year, next year, the next couple of years, that they'll have, they'll have the, the keen insights as to the nuances of that curriculum instead of just reading a template and saying, I see where they're going with this. They'll know how much emphasis is put on this section, how much this one gets, why this is a priority goal, why this is a secondary goal. So I think there are uh, numerous benefits, and in, in over the next couple of years we'll realize more. And just to add one more thing, I, I was going to kind of um, talk about that too, but... Just when the idea first came out, we were having a meeting about something completely not about looping, and and I just I'm just kind of used to putting out all these wishes at the end of each year about hey can I try this can I do that and maybe and from my perspective and, and definitely I didn't even mention it to Elizabeth either and I kind of blurted out she's like yeah I'd be interested in that too uh, it's just the opportunity to this is my third year teaching fifth grade and I just I feel like you know. If I teach it too long, I'll, I'll get a little stagnant. And so I, I like the opportunity to work with the person coming in my place in fifth grade and, and kind of justify, if you will, what I've done, how I kind of approach the curriculum, uh, strategies I used, um, and, and really why I did it, and look at, well, how would you do it, um, and, and see what they can do with that same material. And then, likewise, going into sixth grade, I feel more on my toes when I have something kind of new to wrap my arms around and, and uh, as much as I try to call myself on it and avoid it, I think there is a, a sense of um, comfort, is probably a better word to use than complacency, that you can develop teaching the same thing. And, and I, I find myself at the end of a unit looking back on what I taught and, and thinking, oh, I never talked about that. I talked about it last year though and it was great. So those little things that you just don't see and analyze, I think, I'm really looking forward to uh, being a little bit more on my toes and, and like Steve said, um, understanding the five, six, because I really feel in fifth grade that we're not really we're part of the middle school, but we're kind of like the middle, middle school. 
And it's kind of our job to take the ball and not drop it as we give it to the sixth grade, and then they're, they're off and running. So I, I feel it's a, uh, just a natural, a natural point to try uh, this model in our, in our district. So. Now, we already have situations in subject areas like in mathematics, for instance, or in science where students have a teacher in the seventh grade and they have that same teacher again. It's not by design, it's by scheduling. This is purposeful and by design. There may be families who say, you know, thanks for the opportunity, but we, we'd rather try something else for next year. That's fine. We'll honor those, those requests. Um, the uh, placement of students into next year's fifth grade what I put out for information on that is that uh, if, if parents do not want to get involved in the looping, then they can notify me uh, about that. But I'm not going to entertain requests for people saying, I absolutely have to have this for my child. Because my personal take on it is, who couldn't benefit, what student couldn't benefit from consistency, coherence and co consistency? So every student can. So I, we were going to work very hard to make uh, two classes that look just like any of the other fifth grade classrooms and don't get loaded up in any particular direction or any, any slant that we can figure out. Any questions? So those students currently in fifth grade this year, will they be part of the looping for next year or no? The students who he, yeah. had, whom he, he okay. and Elizabeth have this year yeah. will loop with them unless the, the families request otherwise. And it, now Adam teaches uh, not just the, the math and science, but he also teaches an accelerated math. And we've worked with Gary Record on that, who is a sixth grade accelerated math teacher. And at, he's going to step aside from that for the next year. And Adam's going to teach that component as well. So that group loops for next year as well. And uh, Joe Dome will take on the accelerated fifth grade. And the, um, the parents, out of the 45 kids that we have between our two classes this year, only two parents have expressed concerns. Um, and they weren't even necessarily adamant no's. They were, you know, here's what, I, here's what my opinion is. Um, and we were able to, you know, talk with them. Uh, but every, everyone else has just been overwhelmingly positive about this. So, and I'm really excited because I think it's a, kind of a progressive thing to do, and I think it's uh, something that we could use a whole lot more of. Um, and I, I think it's a good, uh, the ideal district and, and setting with the supportive uh, parents that we have to, to try something like that, too. Um, I, well, first of all, I'd like to applaud you taking the initiative to do that, and um, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how the kids progress and I'll be able to report because I'm lucky enough to have a child in, a in Adam and Elizabeth's class. And um, in, I have to say he was perfectly comfortable and actually burst through the door um, with excitement about hearing that, that the looping would happen. But I, um, thank you for trying that out and taking that risk. I think it's going to be um, a really, really exciting thing for the kids and for you and Elizabeth. And, I appreciate you taking the initiative. No problem. I would speak to it only briefly, is that in my day it wasn't called looping. It was a long time ago, but 35 years ago when we moved to middle schools, I was teaching sixth grade and I was moved to third grade to teach. And I taught those third graders and then I taught them as fourth graders and then I taught them as fifth graders. And what we learned is, number one, I was the only male teacher there, so I had an interesting crew that worked with me. But it's exactly what you said. We learned to work together. The transition point wasn't there. They got more days of learning in those three years than they ever would have with three different teachers. Because we were, second year we were able to start day one, ready to move, the third year we were ready to start. And it was difficult for them and for me at the end of fifth grade to send them off to middle school. But it's a, it was a great opportunity. And I still see them today now in their early 40s who uh, still comment on remembering what we did those three years. So I, I appreciate what you're doing. Adam's not even in his early 40s. I know. <laughs> I, I was going to say the years I did it, and I thought some of these people weren't born then, so I'm just going to be very careful what I say. <laughs> Steve, I'm sorry. Can you describe to me again what the team structure will be in the fifth grade next year? What the what? The who, who will be teaching fifth grade next uh, year? So there'll be the, uh, we have two teams that are in place right. uh, this year that will remain in place. Right. There's the, the three W's, that's uh, Kathy Walsh, 
uh, Walt, uh, Margaret Welch and um, Matt Whaley. And then there's a two-person team that is Kate Carlonis and Sally Connolly. And then the third team will be Joe Doan and Claire Ramsbach. Okay. Um, I, you said something at the end about and um, Joe Doan will teach. There is an accelerated math that Adam is teaching currently, uh, has been teaching the last couple of years in the fifth grade. Okay. There'll still be an accelerated math next year. Uh, when Joe joins the fifth grade, he will pick up that component. Uh, we're, we're going with the pre-transition series uh, from the Chicago program for next year, and that's a sixth grade program. Fortunately, the one-year accelerated placement for the fifth graders, they use the sixth grade program. So Joe will be right up to speed with uh, that new program and will not have missed a beat in rejoining the sixth grade the year after. And does Joe also teach just regular? Uh, he has uh, one, uh, just as Adam has this year, he has two sciences, one regular mathematics and one accelerated mathematics. Mm -hmm. We prefer the term <clears throat> constant higher velocity math because we're not really increasing in speed. It's just, <laughs> I, I had thought of that for the science people and then they left. That would be in certain direction. It doesn't have to be. Anybody else? Questions? Thank you very much. Okay, Safe passage trip. Susan? Before you two start speaking, one thing I had not thought of when this was in here, are you looking for a vote tonight as approval or not uh, for this tonight, or is it, this a presentation on it only? It's, it's basically a blessing. Um, I think in the past, community services, when they've done trips of this nature, they come to the school board looking for a blessing. I don't know that it's an official vote um, from past history, um, but I believe it's just simply you saying, yeah, we buy into what it is that you're doing and we think it's something to pr proceed on. Um, which is why I wanted to just step to the mic first, is to just say that um, Susan is doing all the work and community services is simply supporting the effort. Uh, same as what happened the last time when they went, which was last year. And um, it, it, she'll speak of the program itself, but Community Services is on board with, with this entire effort and hope that you will join us in that support. Thank you. Hi, I'm Susan Dana, and I teach Spanish at the uh, middle school. And actually, I took the group. It was in June 2007. It seems as if it was just last year, but in June 2007. And I know some of you are on the board when I came a few years ago. but. Um, I would like to take another group. We've had a few years break. I've had a number of students and community members ask if there's going to be another safe passage trip. Uh, it was just a very successful trip. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Um, but I think if you aren't familiar with Safe Passage, it is an organization that's based in, in Maine, a nonprofit organization that um, provides educational and medical and emotional uh, social support for the children whose parents work in the Guatemala City Dump. Um, it is, we are going to a third world country. Um, it's safe passage takes a lot of uh, precautions as well as community services. I really like working with community services. It was just a nice to have that umbrella and the fees could go through them. And, um, so I would, I would propose I'd like to take a, a group, and I think you have a packet there. There's a lot of information already in the packet. Safe passage has changed their rules a little bit. I do have to say that they changed many of their, many of their rules. If you go to their new website with their support team handbook, they based a lot of their, no, all, probably about 50% of their support team handbook is based on the Cape Elizabeth team and what we did when we went down. Um, I had, actually, this picture is, if you go to the support team to their webpage, this is a picture of Cape students, and this is the front page of their, uh, on, on their webpage for the support team. Um, one thing that, that we did, which I think now is required of all the support teams, is that you do have to, you have to have a project ahead of time. We went down with three different projects that we had done, and we spent the whole year working on the project, and that's one reason why I'm coming now because I'd like to get the teams, the support team, organized now um, so we can start developing the project. Students learned how to write lesson plans, and they had to learn how to use all the vocabulary to teach ultimate Frisbee in Spanish, or um, some of the projects that they came up with. It was completely student-generated, and I'm just there to try to guide the students. Um, students have to have at least two years of Spanish, and um, the, the trip is, is quite a bit more expensive this, this time around, and that's, I think, in part because of the economy. Safe passage administrative fees have gone up. And uh, that's another reason why I'd like to start early, because if some students do need to fundraise, um, they have time to, to earn money. 
um, during the summer. Part of the program will also be fundraising. Um, I plan to meet probably once a month next year to, to come up with to support the students. Um, so I guess that's it. You do the packet. I don't know if you've got, if you have any questions, but I'm really excited to take a group again. It was just, I think our whole community was behind this trip. Uh, we were asked, we spoke, when we came back, we spoke to Lions, we spoke to the Rotary, we spoke to Brownie Troops, we spoke to the seniors. Um, and I really think the people in town felt vested in this. And, and our students were the ambassadors representing the town of Cape Elizabeth in, in Guatemala. It was just a wonderful community service project. Um, so if you've got any questions, I'm happy to answer. Questions? Or... Good luck. Thank you. Um, the April 28th board workshop, um, briefly, we have been trying, since our workshops are not televised, to sort of give a quick recap on our workshop. Um, the school board discussed professional development at its April workshop. Um, all professional development activities are pre-approved by the building principal and our superintendent. And I actually spent some time going through the huge notebook of um, some of the examples and professional development activities that our staff have been engaged in. And some of examples, just so people could sort of understand what it is, they um, attended and taught at the Cape Tech Academy. They, there were several, um, a lot of curriculum work that seemed to be the focus. Mentor training, grade level team meetings to explore models for development of collaborative professional learning communities, delineation of lesson plans, student um, support teams, review of procedures and protocols, attendance at seminars, um, building days towards cu curriculum work. So, when we speak of professional development, that is um, what our teachers are doing. So I just wanted to share that. Um, I don't know if anyone has any other questions or comments that they'd like to add. OK, superintendents waiver tuition and alternative enrollment. I'm just going to report briefly on this. I seem to hear a lot of questions, particularly at this year, uh, at this time of year, about students who want to come into the system. And so I thought I'd just spend a few minutes to explain to you some of the steps that I do take. I think the, the one that is the most common, and I know is the most common at this point, is superintendent's agreements. And by uh, law, what, it, what this means is, is that a parent can request that their child, even though they don't live in Cape Elizabeth, can request the opportunity for their child to attend school here, or vice versa. What they have to do is to produce a document which talks about why they feel it is best for their child to transfer either into or outside of Cape Elizabeth and uh, give approval for that consideration. When that happens, and let's use as an example a child who wants to come in here from another district, what the parent must do is they must write to the superintendent of the district where they live and they must write to me. And I take a look at the application, I, look, I call the school, find out how the student is doing in their, their school, where they are located at that point. Take a look at, do they have other programs and services in that, in that uh, situation? And then I take a look at whether they would be a good addition to the Cape Elizabeth School Department. I've also had a few kids who have done just the opposite and asked for transfer outside. But what the superintendent's agreement does is it allows the stipend that comes to a town to be transferred to the town where the student is going. So for instance, if I have a student who is coming in here from another town, once these documents are signed, the information is sent to the Department of Education, and the money that normally would go to that other town for that child's education would come to us. So it's approximately $9,000. Uh, part of that agreement is that number one, they must attend school on a regular basis. Number two, they must maintain appropriate grades. And number three, they must avoid any type of disruptive behavior in the school. And the last part is that the parent is responsible for transportation. We don't transport from another town into here, or we don't transport to another town. So that is probably the most common one, and that is the one where I begin to get requests, usually in early February, and they keep coming. I have, if you'll remember correctly, we talked earlier, I have approved the requests of any teachers who have children who live outside of the district but would like their kids to attend Cape schools because they teach here. I have approved those. I have some other requests which I have not approved because one of the things I do watch very carefully is the size of our classrooms. And I have several uh, people who have requested kindergarten placement uh, that are not the children of um, teachers that I have not approved at this point 
and have told them that it will be a while before I can do that because I'm watching very carefully what our kindergarten placement is. Uh, but we also have people who transfer in. I just got an email today from the secretary at the high school who tells me that as of today we have 12 new students enrolling for 0910 at the high school. Seven of these are from local private schools who are coming back to uh, public school and eight of them will be in the ninth grade. So, so you know, that's, that's the type of data I'm always looking for, so I am well aware of what's going on in this process. Now, these students are all students who live in Cape Elizabeth and are returning to their home base. I talked with Dom today. Dom is well aware of three students that are coming in uh, that were not here before will be new students. So there are, uh, there are students moving in all the time. And so I try to keep a very close tab on where we are with that information. The second, second issue of students coming in is homelessness. Dom is our homelessness director. Uh, we don't happen to have any homeless students in Cape at this point in time. But if we did, what we have to do based on the law is we have to provide services for them so that they can attend school. That is not a profit-making operation. They would attend here, and we must maintain the law around it. CAPE has not, as, far, as long as I've been here anyway, has not had homeless students. However, in uh, both of the districts I was here prior to, we had a fairly large population of homeless students who came. The third issue that a lot of people have asked me about is tuition, or two schools. I've done some initial re uh, look at tuition students. Uh, normally, tuition is for a town where you don't have a high school. But that does not mean that limits tuition. And so one of the issues we can look at, if there is enough interest, is to look at tuition attendance here in Cape Elizabeth. Again, I would feel very strongly, and I felt very strongly in the last district I was in with a high school, that tuition was not just, I want to come to your school, so I'm coming. But there was a series of steps that had to take place. I have not gone far enough yet because I'm not sure whether the board is interested in my looking at tuition or not, but I did think I need to put that on the table. But what really got me started besides dealing with superintendent's agreements is foreign students. And uh, I had a message from a parent in the district who had seen the article about what was going on in Camden, at Camden Hills High School. So I started doing some checking, and, to be, and I talked with uh, Pat Hopkins, who was a superintendent, at uh, Five Town CSD, uh, who I also worked with very closely when I was a superintendent of the Mid Coast. And so I, I gathered some data from her, just initial data, what should we know? Some of the pieces that she gave me, uh, which I knew beforehand is, in order to bring a foreign student in, now this is not a student who is exchange student, but a student who is going to live here, pay tuition. They must receive approval through an F1 visa. And that is a different process. I went through that process again in the district I was in before. It cost us $2,500 to become an F1 visa carrier. And so we must, we must register our program through Homeland Security, and we must have that visa process. Getting that visa process can take six months to a year to get, take that initial step. What you also have to determine is your relationship with exchange programs, because we do use some exchange programs at the high school. I think the biggest factor that hit me in talking with Pat about this is what I had heard is kids were coming here for four years to go through the high school and get a diploma. Public schools at this point in time cannot do that. By federal law, if you're a public school, you can only bring them in for one year. You, they can only have a visa for one year. If you're a private school, like and I mentioned here, there were three that I had talked with, our uh, Lee Academy, uh, which is up in Penobscot County, Thornton Academy, and Washington Academy are doing this. They are bringing kids in on a four-year basis. And in talking with Lee Academy, which is a pretty small town uh, north of Bangor, <clears throat> is that they have now 100 students there from China and that area, and they have another 100 students who would come in a minute if they had a place to put them. But they don't have that right now. I heard that Thornton Academy is building a dorm and is going to open it up to handle four-year students. So if we look at it from Cape Elizabeth's point of view, 
We could only do it on a one-year basis. They could not stay for four years. The other piece that I found interesting was the discussion I had with them about the students themselves. And one of the things they were very clear about is do very careful research before you start bringing students in. Because the difference in culture in some other places can be difficult in an American society. And what they talked about particularly was the alpha male, where in some countries the male is the dominant figure, the female, whether it's the mother of the family or whoever it is, is seen as a servant figure. And so they said that's one thing you want to look at and study very carefully. I did find out today that there is an agency in Portland who has just moved here out of New York City that does a lot of the uh, work around taking a look at students, what you do with them, how you manage it, etc. So when I saw Pat on fr last Friday again, I talked with her and she said, even though we have these limitations, we are moving ahead. We're going to continue to look at it. And so Pat has agreed that she and I will keep in very close communication if Cape decides they want to continue to look at this. One of the things she said was that I, as superintendent, cannot supervise it because you must be in the building where the student's coming from. So in Camden, it's the principal of the Camden High School. In our school, it would either be Jeff or someone like that who would oversee the process. But I thought it was important information. I read the article. It was a, a very interesting article. And then I also listened to a portion that was on public TV. And so it had some interesting perspectives. But uh, as Pat and I talked about is, there are a lot of pieces you need to look at before you make the final decision. But I think it's only important that you hear that, understand that, and then when, if you want to uh, discuss it, come up with some ideas, I am very willing to follow through on it if you would like to do that. But the, those are the pieces of information I have so far. Is there anyone on the board who has questions or comments? Or? I have a question, Ellen. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned going back to the um, superintendent's agreement yes. between schools. You mentioned something about $9,000. Yes. It's approximately based on what the town gets for their uh, subsidy, but it usually runs between eight and $9,000. So we don't get $9,000 no, no, for we don't. the DOE. No. For That's us. why I see this as a profitable measure as they long as I'm not bringing in students who are identified with other serious problems. So if they came, say South Portland mm -hmm. wanted to send a student here, you're saying... See, I was being very careful about where he's... Well, uh, <laughs> you know, if South Portland wanted yeah. to send a student, we might get eight or $9,000. Yeah. Yeah. But if we send somebody out, they're not going to want our somebody because well, we gives us nothing. A lot of them do. And we don't have a lot that leave. We have some. Normally, like when I look at Cape Elizabeth and students who leave to go somewhere else, they're normally going for some kind of program we don't offer. And again, since you use the term of the town next, the city next door, uh, like I can think of one student who really wanted to be in the performing arts program at South Florida High School. It's a, it's a very highly regarded uh, program, very highly regarded musical program. And so I spent a lot of time working with the family and decided in the long run that was the best choice for that child. Mm -hmm. A lot of students will choose to come here, uh, mainly because of the standing of the high school and also because the number of advanced placement courses we offer and therefore the opportunity they have to take those. And a lot of times some places will also look at the performance of their high school in comparison to Cape Elizabeth and whether they feel they would get a better educational program at Cape Elizabeth. But if we had, say, a South Portland yeah. student that came here and say we got eight or 9,000, mm -hmm. it does not cover the expense of of um, educating that student. Yeah. Do we have the ability to charge the no. parents the difference? No. Okay. We um, would under tuition. We don't under superintendent's agreement. How many students do we have that are coming here from other towns? At this point in time, for 9 10, mm. I have, other than the children of teachers who teach here, right. I have five students. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Mary, you were, I think, you were next. Kathy, got it. Okay. Any questions or comments? Uh, I'd be interested to learn a little bit more about the tuition concept. I'm a little overwhelmed by the foreign student one. Um, considering that it can only be one year at a time, that is a very big turnover every year. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of housing issues and things like that, I, I um, 
I shudder. So, but the tuition one, I'd, let, I'd be very interested. I, 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 I believe that there are some pretty strict state guidelines around how you can do this. So I'd like to, I, I think that would probably be really important for us to know as a board what those are. And I'd be more than happy to get those. As I said, I did that in the town I was in before, but it's also because we had two towns related to us who did not have a high school. And so we charged tuition. <clears throat> and so we, we had, I think we had about 150 kids who were tuition students at that point in time. So I would be more than happy, just as long as I know you'd like me to do that, I'd be more than happy to gather the information on what kind of a picture would that offer for Cape Elizabeth. Yeah, I'd like to know. Okay. I almost want to think that there's a policy. We have a policy. Well, I'm yes. just wondering if the policy committee might be the place to work with Alan to investigate that, collect more information, and then sort of do a presentation or recommendation to the board. Sure. Anybody else before we move on? That will teach topic. me to raise my hand. Well, I think it does need some more information, and we need to sort of give it a home. So thank you, Alan. Um, moving down, middle school family leave request. Yes. Uh, you have that document is from Trisha Wilkins and what she has written is that uh, I am writing you the letter today to happily announce that my husband and I are expecting our second child a boy and we are expecting the child on August 24th. What she is requesting is not a year off but a part of a year. It's the kind of the relationship piece that she looks at with this birth as late as it is coming. One of the pieces I want to speak to you as I do this also about this and the other one is in the three, four years I have been here, we have normally uh, given that extended leave, whether it's a full year or a partial year. And I think part of the reason we've done it is, and many of them are at Pond Cove, is that Tom has had quite good success in finding people who come in to sub for that year. The history has been, and we have, the, and we have that this year, when a person is hired to come in to take someone's place for that year, they are hired on a one-year basis. If at the end of that one year, that teacher who was out decides they don't want to come back at all, that position is still open and anyone can apply for it at that point in time. And I wanted to be sure you understood that piece of the puzzle. And we have one of those teachers right now who was a one-year position. Uh, the person is coming back, but if the person wasn't coming back and she wanted to take that job, she would have to apply along with other people. So with Trish, uh, after looking at this and talking with her, uh, I think uh, this is one of those, and I talked to Steve about it, I think this is one of those people where we would look at giving her that 12 weeks, which is up to the 16th of November, or 13th of November, when she returned to work on the 16th, uh, as time to spend with her child. This would be unpaid time, to be very sure you understand this. And you can grant this, Alan. You're not looking for approval right, from us. Right. I just, I just bring it to you so you understand it. And if there are questions, because I know there have often been questions. Question. Um, do we have a policy at this point about leaves of absence? Does anybody know? It's all law, if I recall. It's it all is, given it, by the family medical, medical leave. leave. It is. But the leaves that we've been giving are outside of the law. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, hers is a family. Uh, probably is. Um, and so I, <coughs> over, the, over the years, I am concerned that we are consistent with what we do with all employees. Um, and since there's different members of us and time passes, we may not be consistent. And so I'm wondering if we should not draft a policy. Sorry, Rebecca. <laughs> draft we discuss it. To you again. Yeah. Outside of what is legally required. That is all that we have to do. If we choose to do things above and beyond that, my, con my first question will be, is it in the best interest of the students first? And should we not have a policy so that we are consistent with all employees, whether it's today's request, next week's, next month, or two years from now? Because um, I, I think we should be consistent. And I would speak to that only. Kathy is right. When I came here as a new superintendent, I really had to go back to find out what has the history been behind this. And I could have easy, easily come in as a new superintendent and just said, we're not giving these anymore. 
but I did take the time to find out what our history has been and how we've done it. But I think you're right. I think the policy kind of sets the plan of right. what you do. And we could always refer back to it, or future school boards could refer back to it so that they know. And I'm not making a suggestion as to what the plan will be. I'm just saying that maybe we should. We also have to consider that it's probably contractual language, too. Mm -hmm. So we'll have, to, we'll have to look at the contract. It's the teacher contract? Mm -hmm. There is nothing in the contract that I recall that has anything to do with leave of absence. There's a there's a re legal requirement. Re legal requirement. But um, and you know maybe Dwight remembers differently. But there's a legal requirement. But it refers to the legal requirement. Once we've mm -hmm. once we've met the legal requirement, we we do not have to go beyond that. We have consistently been going beyond that. So I'm saying, I think we should have a policy for whatever we're doing beyond the legal requirements. Okay. So policy chair. If you wouldn't at least address that in one of your sitting over meetings. here, you can't. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else on that? Yeah. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Moving, oh, on geez, to gonna throw me <laughs> Moving on to new business. Um, I, I do have one other oh, I'm person. Sorry. I do have one other person. Uh, you have one here for Talia Edlund as well. Oh. Uh, Talia has, was out last year with her baby. She came to me several, two or three months ago. And initially what she came to talk with me about is the possibility of having half of a position if anyone was willing to do the other half. And so I went to Tom at that point, asked Tom to do some checking. He had no one at Pond Cove who wanted to go to a half-time position. Uh, then uh, Talia and I talked about the possibility of an ELL position uh, as a half-time. And as you know, I have the ELL teacher has uh, retired and I have the new position open. However, I'm also very much aware of the fact that I have at least three more students coming in from Brazil this year to increase our population. I feel strongly I want that to be a full-time teacher. And so we are in the process right now of uh, working to hire that full-time teacher. Uh, then I know that there is a half-time position that may open up that she's going to apply for. But I have not brought this to you, and I thought, thought I better do it because June is right here. So what she has said to me is, number one, she is requesting a half-time position if one opens. If it doesn't open, then she is requesting a year, excuse me, another year's leave of absence for, for this position. Again, I went back, I had some conversations with a couple of you about these, uh, looked at past history that Kathy just talked about, and historically, we have given that second year. We haven't given it a third, a fourth, or a fifth, but we've given the second year. So what I, what I am recommending to you is that, we, that I grant Talia another year uh, without pay. At the end of that year, she must return or else give up her position altogether. And if a half-time position opens up and she gets it, then she could come back for that half-time position. So that's, that's kind of the long explanation. So I had two letters. This is one of the two letters. And so that's kind of where I am at this point in time. Can you just clarify, Ellen, yes. I, I, that is under new business. Yep. So does that mean this one we need to vote on? Or is this just an, an FYI? As My well? sense is it's, it's an FYI to you. Uh, I often will put them there just because I want to know how you, if you're comfortable with my thinking around it, uh, if you feel that you need to do something officially, then can take the vote at that point in time. Uh, these are always tricky ones uh, because I want you to I, I want you to be comfortable with the decisions that are made. So you can either do it as giving me guidance to go ahead, or you can take a vote to decide whether you want to give her that with the understanding that she could get the half time. What have we done in the past? We've always we've always taken a vote on it's gone. You see, I didn't. I don't know that. I don't mind back yeah. to look. So this would be the second year. Second year. Second She's looking year. for either a second year or to come back on a part-time part basis. But if we were to extend her for another year, then we're holding her position available. A Correct. Position. A, a position. A position available. Not necessarily the position she left, but, but a position. Would you be? Yes. Um, Comparable position. Yeah. And what if none exists? When she comes back in for leave, what well, happens? the one that exists is the person who's, who's subbing for her. Oh, okay, so that would work. Okay, yeah. but she potentially could bump somebody. Right. I agree. Yeah. The way we've normally done it—that's a good question. The way we have normally done it 
is they are uh, available to come back to the position that is being filled by the substitute now. This year with Tom, we've got so many adjustments back and forth, it could be about any grade level down there. Right, and but, we also went down on the teachers, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's I, I, well, thoughts, comments. I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you because I was sort of on a roll before. I think that giving an employee a year's leave of absence, for me, is enough. I don't feel that we should go and give a second year. It's not about person. It's about consistency for the students. Um, I know people don't like the analogy, but in, in the private sector, you have 12 weeks. And that's it. That's all that's required. After that, you can be let go, terminated, however you want. So I think that we're pretty generous in giving a year to some folks that have asked for it. Um, I'm not comfortable going a second year. So, and it's not, again, it's not about any individual person. And, and that's why I brought up the whole thing about the policy, because I think that once we've done a year, um, I think we've done well by the employee, and the employee, you know, if they're not able to come back, we need to move forward with another consistent teacher, and I'm thinking about the students and not leaving the students hanging for another year, or the person who may be filling in, um, who's saying, I'm filling in for a year, oh, now maybe I'm filling in for a second year, but they don't have a permanent position either, and it's waiting on somebody else's decision, so I personally would not support a second year. For very much the same reasons, um, and that's why I was asking the questions I was asking. If we're going to hold her position open, the students have already gone one year with a substitute. We don't want to have that substitute returning, no matter how good they are. Um, again, if they're a good substitute, somebody we do want to hire full-time, I think it's only fair to have that position available for them and not hold it for another year. Um, and it also, you know, in this particular case, we're not sure that second year is going to do it, that she's going to come back full time. She's, it, it appears she's looking more for a part time position. So, for the same reasons, I really don't support this. I don't feel comfortable changing what we've done in the past until we have a policy. And if in the past we have approved two-year contracts, uh, two-year extensions of, of leaves, I think we should do that until we have the policy discussion. You have any thoughts? I find myself agreeing with Kathy's thoughts after listening to it. Mary? hate to lose any talented teacher. I mean, I understand what Kathy and Linda are saying. I think, I think those are points well taken. I also know Talia is a, is a real asset to the school community. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I'd feel differently if I knew for a fact she was coming back. Um, but uh, um, I'm not sure. I feel a little conflicted, I'd say. Before I add any comments, I'm just, it, we're sort of, Alan, do you want to vote? How does the board feel? Does the board feel that they want to vote on this or just sharing the comments with Alan? It's, it's your decision to make. Are you? I, th I think where, where I am at this point in time, and I am tending to agree with Rebecca, is we don't have, we have not, if we have a policy, we haven't pro followed it, but I don't think we have a policy. I'm concerned about changing the plan without having a policy in place. Uh, so that's where I'm kind of stuck, and that's what kind of where I came tonight, is I looked at what we've done in the past, and in the past we've done it this way. So, I, so I, that's why I stayed at that, that point. Uh, I think the request for a look at a policy and developing a policy mm -hmm. for future decisions would be very helpful to me also when I have the discussions with these people. But my normal discussion with them is based on past practice in case and past practice in Cape, from what I, from the time I have been here, is we have allowed that second year. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where, I, where I feel that uh, I need, you know, need to be sure that we're all clear on the direction. And if it's going to change, which I don't have a problem with, I think it needs to change policy-wise as we go ahead. I think the question is, is do we vote on it or is it Alan's yeah. decision? Yeah. 
That's a, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm stunned that none of us have an institutional memory about this. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I, I almost I believe that I, we vote. I do yes, too. I, I do, do too. too. Um, I think the first one you don't vote on because it's an extension of the maternity, you know, the time right after right. she's had a baby. This is a second year. Right. Uh, I had the baby is that year out, but I would have to go back. But if we have sure. no policy, no. how do you know that this is a distinction? I think in the past we've, Alan's made a recommendation and then we primarily have voted to accept it or, I mean, I think in the past we've always accepted it. And, and I think no, for the first one, as far as Trisha's concerned, it's, I, I, I probably could be proven wrong, but I don't remember having one like this where it's for 12 weeks after the birth of the baby and that's it. Uh, and I don't know, I'm looking at Pauline, if you remember where I've had one of those? Usually I'm involved with a one year or a two year probability. Okay, it, it, doesn't the Family Medical Leave Act require an institution to provide family medical leave right after the birth? I mean, I don't even know why it, it's up for debate. That one isn't. No. That one's no, done. No. We're, Alan can make that choice. The one we're talking about is this extended <coughs> second year right. leave of absence. Right. I think that's the one, and, and I guess I'm, I, thought we had voted in the past on those. Extended leave, not the family medical leave. So now that we've talked about it, we're going to have a motion. I'm just... Yeah. Well, we're not into new business yet, so... Yeah, I'm just going to add a couple of comments, and then I think I will ask for a motion. I'm going to agree with something that almost all of you have said. I agree with Rebecca that I think if we don't have a policy, we don't want to change course. I agree with Kathy that we need a policy. And I think the one thing that I would do, both Linda and Kathy have commented on, commented on and I agree with, is how it impacts students. But I think we have to remember two things. One, it's for a full year. So it's not like some of these other leaves where you have someone come in in December and then it's a different teacher. So the students start the year and end the year with the same teacher. And also, that one teacher, when they're hired, their first year is probationary anyway. So there is no guarantee that that teacher would have a position the second year. So I'm going to stop then, and I think, since I think the board has said they want to vote on this, see if anyone is willing to make a motion. I move that we approve the extended leave of absence for a Palm Cove staff member as presented by the superintendent. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. We've all had conversation, but is there, are there any comments or questions now that we have a motion on the table? If we were to approve this extended leave, would we be looking to advertise and hire a replacement for her full-time position? No. There's staff in the building that can be used. Because of the staff you have there? You have permanent staff who's there? President, Tom, if you could come up and just explain that. Yeah. We're in a, we're in a very question. different position this year because the number of changes we've had at Hong Kong. Not usually that way. I mean, uh, this is the latest metric on it. We, we've had three people out on a one-year leave. That was uh, including Talia. Um, you know, one's not coming back. Agda's not coming back. Fran and Fran is, but we also are going down one position. So among the staff we have, that would actually, I think, save a job the way we are now. Mm -hmm. Alan, can you correct my arithmetic? We've been through this. I, no, I think that's where yeah. we are. We, you, you and I have gone back and forth on it yeah. several times to figure out where we are. Otherwise, we would. I think we would bump somebody. You're eliminating a grade, a, a teacher grade. in eighth grade, because of enrollment. Yeah. So you'll have a teacher available to take Talia's classroom because of that. Right. Oh, that's right. That's that's aside from the one-year position, because we're down one teacher. Any other questions? Linda, did you and have so, a follow-up question? Yes. And so after this first year, our we're going to be in a position where she would indeed bump somebody else because we're more overstaffed unless we're looking at a projection for an increase in enrollment that's going to require that extra position. Either right? that or um, there's usually a request to take a sabbatical or take a leave. Mm -hmm. It's not predictable, but that's the way it averages out. <clears throat> Confusing enough? Mm. Anybody else have a question or comment, Linda? You nope. Okay. Um, 
All those in favor of extending the leave as the motion presented by Rebecca. Uh-oh. I know. All those opposed? We agree. <laughs> okay. You're the tie vote, Alan. <laughs> So does that mean the motion fails? Yes. You have to have another vote and mm -hmm. maybe our workshop. We have a special business meeting with, with um, Karen here. Um, you, when do you need an answer on well, this, Ellen? What I'm sitting here thinking about is two things. Is that number one, there still is this possibility of a half time position. I don't know whether that's going to happen or not. I think the other piece, after Tom presented what he just presented, that draws a very different picture of what we've ever had in the past. So I probably need to talk with Talia about that and let her know what that may offer as well. So what, if we could uh, relook at this uh, at the workshop. Fine. Okay. No one can be sick that night. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, consideration to approve high school co-curricular fee positions. We have two co-curricular fee positions, and these are ones that didn't get submitted the first time. So I, uh, Jeff is saying yes. So these are, the first one is Megan Greenlaw, who is a 10th grade class advisor, which she has been doing. And this just makes her officially a class advisor. And this is one she has been doing in the past, am I correct? The second one is Sharon Merrill, who's the department head of the guidance. Same thing, was not on the original list, so it's bringing that list up to date. Uh, again, with the position as she has already been served. I move that we approve the high school co-curricular fee positions as presented by the superintendent. Second. Thank you, Rebecca and Linda. All those in favor? Thank you, sir. Okay, consideration to approve the proposed school calendar for the 2009-10 as presented. I was, the only thing I was going to say, John is not here tonight, so Steve said he would speak to it and he had talked with, with John about any questions you may have. But I figure that probably goes to you first anyway. Yeah, um, the policy committee um, reviewed the calendar. Um, it had no uh, suggested changes. There was no public, um, I think there was one public e comment email which was commending the, um, com no. No, go ahead. Uh, com commending the committee on, on its work. Um, is there another email I don't know about? Yeah. Okay. One from Sue Harper that I forwarded on to Alan, to John. John, that she had some very interesting suggestions that I thought might want to be addressed. I thought she'd send it to the whole board. I may not have. I don't know. Okay. Okay. So, so um, do we want to do that tonight? Are you prepared to address some of those? Uh, not Sue's question. I'm um, wondering, the policy committee has a meeting prior to our workshop. If we wait to the workshop, the calendar will be adopted by the end of May. How does the board feel about that? Is that sufficient time? I, I, I'm tossing that out. I, well, I know John had that information, so we'll check with him and see where we are. Some of the, the reason why I think they weren't, I'd just like to give one example. Um, in, in some of them I know won't work, but in December, rather than having an early release day on Wednesday the 9th, this particular person proposed doing it on the Tuesday the 22nd. So you reestablished another full week of instruction in December. Yeah. Suggested moving the February 5th um, early release day to closer, I believe, the Friday before the February vacation. Um, the, yeah, the, there's two early release days in March. They're both half days. This person suggested perhaps combining them into one full day. You have the equivalent number of hours. So they were, they, I thought they were fairly interesting, reasonable suggestions. I have all of them. So I'm wondering if it might make sense. Some of them may work, and there might be very valid reasons why they won't work. But I'm wondering if the policy committee, who's meeting next week, wants to relook at it then and bring it to the board at the end of May. John and I did chat about these, and as you were saying, what, I didn't have them right in front of me, but as you were saying, it jogged my memory about them. 
Um, on the December day, for instance, moving the so, – so one of the goals that we were looking at also in this calendar was how do we make the most number of consecutive weeks uh, that, that don't have – that are unbroken, and yet how do we get professional development opportunity time? So the December – the reason that December 9th was originally placed there instead of in the uh, – for instance, on the 22nd was just the fear that – if we have a half day in the 22nd, our attendance Holy will shot. plummet for that day okay. and may that take the 21st sense. with it, but it's a consideration. And just sense. like all of these things, it's good feedback to get. Um, the same with uh, February uh, 12th, which we originally had as a day, um, and, and we've moved that. That was going to be a, a teacher day. So um, if we move the K to 4 day from the 5th to the 12th, then there'd be the question of, does that mean that a lot of families would take advantage of the early flight rates? Maybe more families do that, and we lose attendance on that day as well. Um, the other, uh, what was the other piece that you had just Jeez. mentioned? One today? of the other suggestions was moving one of the um, October, the 22nd and 23rd, um, to October 9th around the Columbus Day weekend. Um, we, when we were talking about that particular month, we were looking at, first of all, that the, that the holiday, Columbus Day, was on the 12th. So we have an incomplete week there. We know that uh, what we're trying to do is get enough weeks into the start of the school year prior to um, fall conferences happening so that teachers would have the opportunity to, to know the kids is, uh, a little bit more and to have possibly some more samples of uh, written work to be able to display and talk about at the conferences. Yeah. So the later that, that we can get those fall conferences in, the better off we are. And so each, and, and we've gone through a number of these scenarios as well. Uh, one of the things that came to me very late in the process was that as we move the February 12th, to um, we, that was originally not scheduled as a day, and then um, the first day of school would have been August 31st, and we did a swap. So we, we put the 12th as a teacher day, as a school day, and had the first week of school become a four day week instead of a five day week for students. And right now, personally, if I had to do it over again, I'd take and keep a four day week but I would have moved that day to the 4th of September and provided the longer um, Labor Day weekend for families than doing it on the 31st. Well, the calendar hasn't been approved. Right, yeah. So that... But it's consideration to, to talk about with colleagues and so forth. So I'm just wondering, are, are you, is the calendar team and slash the policy committee prepared to present this calendar as presented yeah so you want to that's why it's on the agenda okay but so none none of these other suggestions we want to go through we just want to vote it the way it is yeah okay you mentioned the march 19th and 26 um combining those to one day do you uh, oh yes the that's that's the other one if we combine the ninth and the 16th, uh, excuse me, the 19th and the 26th, those are two half days, and those currently count as student days. So if we combine the two half days, even though you'd say, wait a minute, two halves make a whole, you're still out of school the whole day, okay. you lose a school day okay. in the process. We'd have to add another day to, for instance, the end of the year or the beginning of the year. Okay. Now, I've heard that the state is considering doing it by hour. Uh, sign the paper this morning. Um, but I don't know how, where that it's, stands. I think it passed. It passed. It passed. It did pass? Yes. Ooh. So does that allow us to make those changes? Yeah, I saw the same article and I wondered. What? I, I, I think it was, I think what it does is it, it provides districts flexibility around making up snow days. I think it's very specific. Oh, it's only for yeah. snow? That's, that is the way I understood That's it too, that it was done, for instance, if we had seven snow days, it would give us the opportunity to lengthen days, which we have not been allowed to do at this point. We would have to petition the commissioner 
and to extend days in order to, and that's the way I understood it yeah. from what I read this morning. Yeah, that seemed to be the impetus for the whole conversation to begin with. I didn't know if that would then just apply to snow days or apply to giving schools leverage on manipulating the calendar. It, it's worth checking the we language. Check but I think the reason it has come up is because you have a lot of districts who have had this past year seven and eight snow days. And so I think that's how this became a part of the action. Yeah. But I think it is approved on a, on a school system by school system basis, based where you are. For instance, I couldn't get it approved because we only lost four days. But a system that lasts for seven or eight days might be able to add some hours on to each day to add up to that amount. But they've always been, in the past, very strict about that, that you can't add hours to a day and add those up to count as another day of school. Yeah, we've had, we've had years in the past where we had, uh, uh, like, a, a, the October, one year we had the October floods, and, and we've had the ice storms and so forth, where I remember back my last year teaching here, we, the final day of school was June 26th. There were no waivers going to happen uh, for those days. And the flexibility around the hours can help, but then... How are schools going to, what leeway do they give you in other regards? Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Hey, did you make a motion, Rebecca? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't think you did. No. I don't think it was a second. Okay. No, sorry. Uh, I would like to, make to move that we approve the school calendar as presented for 2009 2010. As recommended by the policy committee. Second. Anybody? Well, we want to get home for the Celtics game. Can I have a second? <laughs> second. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Any questions or comments? I, I hate to weigh in so late, but for next year, it, it, it strikes me how many stop and starts we have. You know, I think we have three full weeks of school before we have conferences in the fall, three full weeks, and I, I don't know. I mean, I'll sit in on the policy next year and watch and, and try to understand why that is, but I worry sometimes about um, how many days that, that are, you know, that the kids don't have consecutive learning. And if I could add a piece to that, and I, is, is calendar to? writing, I think it's be difficult. you would find the most difficult process. Full I weeks. I think you'd speak to it. Yep. That calendar writing, no matter what we change, there's another change that could happen. Oh, I know. And we struggled hard this year, as you struggled last year with the group. Uh, there never seems to be a bottom line we can get to where we feel it works for everyone. And so that does become a part of that whole process. And, it, and we were looking at the full the weeks as well. Um, but what we did notice in this is that in, in conversations with some of the middle school folks is that they said, you know, that's 36 days from the start of the school year, school days, 36 school days from the start to the conferences. That's more days than we typically get. That's several, yeah. four or five more days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Since I'm on the bad, bad girl list tonight, I'm not going to go for it. Are you? <laughs> um, we'll split our vote. No. No. <laughs> um, I, no um, I've always had concerns about early release days. In fact, I was probably one of the first people that said, let's kill off the late starts. And the reason I did that was because I thought it was very disruptive for the students. I knew it was. I could hear the kids talking about it. I thought it was disruptive for the parents as well. I'm still not super happy about early release days. And just so you know, next year I'm probably going to try to push to reduce those. I know why they're there. I know what their purpose is. Um, but I still think it's disruptive for the students. And even though it counts as a full day, it isn't a full day. Um, so I will vote for the calendar. I'm just sort of giving you the heads up for next year because I'm going to be pushing for the early release days too. The only thing I would add to that is, is that it is difficult when you are trying, you know, you have talked over and over again about your mission and belief statement and where you want to go. And in order to get the work done that we are trying to get done, 
we are li very limited to the number of full days we can take because those are totally lost days. Uh, I think your number of early release days have shrunk since I first came here, but we still find them very badly needed. So I think as a board, if we're gonna talk about those things, I think we need to talk about the big picture. What do you wanna get done? How do you want it to get done? And when do you want it to get done? Because every time I, I, would, I would speak to the principals, I, I truly gave John the job to head this up this year because it takes so much time to do. And I know Trish can speak to it from what she went through last year. But there are so many pieces to the puzzle, and putting the puzzle together becomes a very difficult process. So I, you know, there's a part of me that finds early release days difficult also, but there's a part of me who says, if we want to have our school system realign to look like we want it to look, we've got to be able to find a way to do it somehow. Make it happen. And Kathy, I just want to sh say that I share your frustration. I, I think it really does um, provide a challenge to the teachers and the schools for creating an educational experience that has a flow to it and a momentum to it. I don't. I don't disagree. I what? No, I no. I'm, I'm saying I agree with you. Yeah. Um, so I, I agree with that assessment about why and 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 the frustration with. But I do remember first my first year on the board with Bob Lyman, um, the discussion around early releases was budgetary, that we could not afford to pay for teacher time to engage in um, curriculum-related, assessment-related discussions um, outside of the um, teaching hours. And so reluctantly, um, the number of early, early releases or late starts were increased. Um, but I definitely remember very clearly it was a budgetary decision. And, I, and um, the middle school principal also spoke at great length about that. Nancy, right? Um, now, so I mean, I think that, that we have to kind of keep that in the back of our mind too, is that. If, if there's work that, we, like, like Alan said, is there's work that we want them to do and we can't afford to pay them outside of school hours, the kind of twixt in between. Kind of going back to the point of consistency, I know that there has been discussions the last two years anyway, I know, about concerns in both the middle school and the high school as far as those Fridays before vacation starts and the dramatic drop in enrollment during those times. So some of the suggestions that were made here actually make more sense. I mean, you're already experiencing uh, quite a drop in um, attendance right before a vacation time, so why not m relocate some of these shorter, these half days to right before the vacation starts rather than, you know, looking at the calendar, having the off day and then having uh, a holiday or a vacation start. I mean, it actually makes more sense. We're already experiencing that. So just, again, just a comment that I wanted to add for us to consider going forward. Anybody else? I'd just like to um, add that I think I agree with everything that's been said, but also think that if you're going to look at it, this, like everything else, is a cost-benefit analysis, and it does cost money to get this work done. And I also wanted to thank the policy committee and the calendar district leadership team and all the time they spent putting the calendar together. I know it's not an easy task. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor of the motion on the table, which is to accept the calendar as presented? 6-0, thank you. Um, Rebecca. Yes, um, okay. We have this evening two policies for second reading. The first one is KI Visitors to Schools. Um, 
There were no comments and no suggestions for changing it after the first reading, as is the same thing for KLD, public complaints about school personnel. So I'd like to move that we approve KI and KLD. Second. Thank you, Rebecca and Linda. Comments, questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? 6-0. Rebecca? And... Um, Excuse me, I'm trying to catch up here. Uh, we have two policies for first reading. The first one is JLCA, the physical exam policy. Um, Jeff, you are working with Tatiana on this. I, let me first ask the, the board if there's any questions about this exam, this policy. It was basically, man, I believe it's a legally required, the, the nurse has spent a good deal of time working on it um, and reviewing it um, and have approved the version that's in front of you. I don't believe that there really is any changes from what was originally presented to them. This is first this reading. This is first reading. <coughs> first reading. Right. So it no, presented to the, to the nurses. Oh. I don't believe they made many changes to it. Just so you're clear. So, um, the, I wasn't actively involved with the nurses, but I know they spent a lot of time looking at it. I think the major thing that they put into this policy, which is different from what we've done in the past, is there is, in the years when the physical exam is not required, there are still questionnaires that students have to do through the athletic office if they want to participate, and this provides that those questionnaires will actually dis be distributed to the nurse's office as well and treated as medical documents as they really should be because they contain medical information. So that was sort of the most significant change that's very important to the nurses. Okay. Uh, any questions on the J policy JLCA? And JLDGB reintegration of students from juvenile correctional facilities. Alan reviewed this, I believe, with MSMA. MSMA. And MSMA. Um, this is the draft that was provided by them. Um, we basically have accepted it as they presented it. We have just are eliminating the notes. Um, we did add in paragraph B, other members will be invited based on the student's specific identified needs. And paragraph C, we have changed it to say should have access to. Paragraph F. Um, we have agreed, we agreed to include the optional statement of the principal may require the student to participate in additional tests or other demonstrations of skill and knowledge consistent with the local assessment system for the purpose of determining appropriate placement. And finally, there's a rather lengthy page long note to the policy, which actually will become, um, I think, administrative. Right for this mm -hmm. one? Right. Administrative action. Right. Okay, so that's for first reading. Um, the policy committee will be taking this in for second reading. If you have any questions or comments for them. Rebecca, wouldn't the note still become part of the policy? Because it's referencing um, statutes, and I think you don't reference statutes in the administrative guidelines. Yep, I'm sorry, you're right. This, I'm thinking of a different one that. I think. Before. No, you're right. This one actually remains part of the policy. So. Perhaps, what I'm thinking is, is perhaps the question for Charlotte, because I wasn't there at your meeting, remember? I sent this on. Yes. I think the question was, would this be a different policy because of what it talks about? The yeah. first policy talks about uh, reintegrating uh, students who have been in a correctional center. This one talks about provides for when a juvenile has been charged with and adjudicated a juvenile offense that involves the use of threatening use of physical. So I've, I'm questioning whether, I think Charlotte was probably saying to us this would be a separate policy, but I'll have to check with Charlotte okay. to be sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what the issue was. Well, well I brought, because I couldn't make it the day at the meeting. Right. I just sent the notes so long. So um, we'll make sure to get clarification of that in the policy meeting. Okay. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, consideration of superintendent's nomination of teachers for continuing contracts. Uh, this is uh, working with the teachers who are on probationary status. 
Uh, the law requires that I have notification of them by May 14th, which is two days from now. Uh, so what you have in front of you first is teachers eligible for continuing contract. In other words, these are people who have been here for two years, have been evaluated for both years, and have been recommended to me. Uh, all these are the teachers we are recommending. This does not mean that all people who have been here are recommended for, these, for their positions. The people we are recommending are Don Rio at Pond Cole as a kindergarten teacher, and therefore will become a continuing contract teacher. Masha Chase for world language at the middle school and also at Pond Cole, half time at each. Kate Carlonis, who would be grade five. Uh, Sonia Latandres, who is the instructional support person. At the high school, it would be Rosalind Gross, who would be the visual arts teacher, and Laura Tripp who would be the world language teacher. So in other words, just so you know the difference, these are the people who finished their second year, have been evaluated both years, and have been judged by their evaluators as people who should continue with us to go on to continuing contract. Do they pass the Alan Hawkins test? They do. <laughs> they do. And my administrators know. I send out the letter to them. The million dollars. Have you got a million question. dollars in your pocket? For right. Me? I move that we approve the superintendent's nominations of teachers for continuing contracts. Thank you, Rebecca. Second. Second. Kathy, thank you. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Okay, Alan. And then the next page are uh, those people who have just finished their first year, are finishing their first year, and we're looking at a second year probationary contract for them. Again, these are the ones who have passed that muster. Mm -hmm. At Pond Cove, it is Mary Jane Johnston for art, who is the new art teacher this year. Middle School is Gretchen Earl for guidance. Tabitha Glanville, who is a .8 social studies teacher. And Elizabeth Johnston, who is a grade five teacher. At the high school, it is Sarah, I do this every time, Beckel, Sarah Beckel, who is the phys ed teacher at the high school. John Brady, who is a one fifth chemistry teacher at the high school. Tabitha Green, no. half-time nurse. Tatiana. Tatiana, excuse me. <laughs> is it time to leave you? Yeah, almost. <laughs> uh, Sarah Harrington, who is social studies. Paul McGovern, who is half-time choral music. Jessica Means, who is the instructional support. And Sarah Ward, who is English. At the district level, you have Kate Vandervalk, who is a speech and language therapist. And you have Dean Zaharis, who for this part of it is half-time technology integrator. And you also know I am paying him an hourly rate to do the uh, data management piece. I move we accept the superintendent's recommendations for teachers eligible for second year probationary contracts. Second. Thank you, Kathy and Rebecca. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Six okay. zero. Linda, um, consideration to approve job description for the maintenance mechanic form. I might look to Alan for some more direction on this. Um, the Human Resources Committee was asked to review this um, job description. We're bringing it forward for the board's approval. This is a new position. Um, this person will be more or less taking over a lot of the responsibilities that um, Ernie McBain was managing while he was here. So we wanted to forward the job description for approval. I move that we approve the job description for maintenance mechanic foreman. As presented. Thank you, Rebecca. Is second. A second. Thank you, Kathy. Any questions or comments? Rebecca. Uh, is this, uh, as I learned this year, Ernie McVeigh's position was shared with the town? Is this, posi this position is 100% ours or is it the town? This position is 100% ours. Okay. Ernie was uh, hired by the town. Ernie's position has changed to a part time, a certain number of hours. I remember the number of hours. 20 hours a week, he's taking on, based on Mike's budget, he is taking on the major uh, facilities work, you know, the big jobs. I need someone who will step in to manage the schedule, et cetera. This is somebody who is already on our staff, who we would be moved to this as a, in, a, in a foreman position. And so I assume then that the sh our share of the 20 hours of Ernie combined with the cost of this position is not greater than what has been budgeted? N no. We are not greater than what has been budgeted, she asked. We don't share our position. Anymore? No. At all? No. Oh, okay. Okay. 
So any major, but any major that job that's to be done at the high school or somewhere, Ernie does. Mm -hmm. And then this person would do the other jobs that are overseen the other way. So then if we did not pay Ernie's salary and we've created this position, we're just taking an existing staff member that we're already paying, creating this position, are we increasing the salary for this position? And by how much, Paul, you I'd have to? And it's in the budget. Yes. It's in the budget. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor? Six zero. Okay, committee reports. Um, is there anyone uh, like to remind the public that um, all the minutes for the school board's committees are on the school website? But having said that, is there anyone who would like to give a um, report? I'll start down there so as not to exclude anyone. Rebecca? Um, I'll just briefly mention that the policy committee held um, a substance abuse contract forum um, with the high school and while the turnout was uh, lower than we had hoped and expected, it was still a very productive discussion and conversation. Um, a number of very, not only perspect interesting perspectives, but some real um, concrete ideas were developed. Um, Jeff is um, boldly going to be reviewing all of the data that was collected that evening. The participants filled out forms, which we now have, um, Jeff has, and I also scribbled some notes. So um, I believe that in our policy committee, we will go over the data that was collected that evening. Um, and again, I want to thank you, Jeff, um, for all of your preparation. <laughs> I wish you all could have seen it. It was pretty amazing. Um, and I want to thank all the parents who did come that evening with um, uh, open, open minds and, um, and a readiness to be very frank and honest with us um, about the issue. I'd just like to add my thank you to Jeff and to Rebecca as the policy committee chair and to the policy committee for um, their willingness to listen and review the policy that was fairly controversial three years ago and their willingness to listen to feedback from the community and um, take a look at that. So thank you again to Jeff and Rebecca. Um, Linda, do you have any notes yep. you'd like to share? Actually, uh, Human Resources, the, we've actually already had our meeting this month. It was on May 7th. Um, exciting times looking at evaluation forums. We, con <laughs> we confirmed. Uh, the superintendent's evaluation, um, the school board self-evaluation form is in the process of being uh, put together. Hopefully we will have the forms ready for our retreat at the end of May for distribution. Um, the school board will be allowed a couple months to fill out their self-evaluation forms uh, with the busy summer holidays coming up. But we wanted to get the forms out to everybody so that they had them and had plenty of time to consider them. Um, our next meeting is the first Thursday in June, and I don't remember what the date is. I'm sorry. I don't remember. It's on the website. It's on the website. It's on the website. There you go. Thank you, Linda. Anything else? No. Nope. Kathy, do you have any comments? Mary? Um, I, we have a communications committee meeting tomorrow at the high school in room 309. Um, where we'll review the goals from and vision from last year um, with the standing committee and see where we want to go. We did meet um, last month on the 28th to discuss the website um, and possibly updating the website. We met with our current webmaster and Gary Lenoy and um, we're looking at the possibility of um, making sort of modernizing that a little bit. We think it's very well designed, but um, maybe um, modernizing it with some photos and some, you know, um, new tabs and bringing in some new technology. And, and, um, but that will be an ongoing process, and we'll be talking about that in the communications committee t meeting tomorrow as well. So. Thank you, Mary. Um, and Karen asked that I do a quick read or update on the Teaching and Learning Committee, which met on May 7th to discuss the curriculum design timeline and the proposed school board workshop topics for this fall. 
The timeline will be updated by Alan and the CIA to be presented to the committee in our next meeting or presented to the school board for approval in our June business meeting. This timeline will help the school board monitor the curriculum management plan and will be the basis for many of our workshops going forward. Workshops will play an important role in informing school board members and citizens about the financial implications of curriculum goals and existing or future program assessment and will help delineate how our budgets are built. Um, public comment on agenda items. I don't think there's any members of the public here. Um, school board, oh, I'm sorry. Can I just say one thing? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm not a member of the public, but I get um, I just wanted to mention to folks that tomorrow night, there is a concert at the high school the music department's putting on. It's a band um, and chorus concert. And they're going to be featuring excerpts from Phantom of the Opera. Mm -hmm. It's at 7.30 in the auditorium. And I think it should be a lot of fun. So I just wanted to mention that. If folks have some time to go, they ought to. I think it'll be great because the band and chorus do a fabulous job. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Do we have to announce that? Linda was just hitting me. Uh, Jeff, would you like to be a member of the public and make a comment? I just wanted to give a quick update on the sports that I Ah, uh, did you talk to Karen about that? I talked to her about that, and she was wondering if you would do that in June because you're waiting, unless you have other information to. I mean, if you would like to share something, that's fine. I did discuss knowing that she wasn't going to be here, and she said she thought June might be better. Excellent. Would you, now that I've. <laughs> <laughs> I would wait for June. It was essentially just getting an update, and we're going to hear something. Are you sure? Okay. Um, anything else? Um, school board agenda requests. Um, announcement of upcoming meetings. All of the dates are on the website. There's two that are not on the website that I'd like to bring to your attention, and I guess they will be, which is teaching and learning, which is June 4th, 1130 to 1, in the superintendent's office. In the District Wellness Committee meeting, June 8th, 3.15 to 4.45, I think, at Community Services. Um, Could you give me the teaching and learning again, please? June 4th, 11.30 to 1. Actually, I think that might be the Thursday that you were mm -hmm. looking for as well. Exactly. The Human Resources, I think that's June 4th. Back to back. Um, Fun. Okay, so I think that's it. Um, it. Can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you. Second. Oh, yes. Now the second to adjourn. Peter, thank you.